Nanjing, a great Chinese city of six million souls. Close to its center, there's a monument to a man many Chinese still call the good person of Nanjing, John Rabe, a German and a Nazi. He's worshipped here as a hero, a living Buddha. In the West, he's unknown. No one remembers that he saved the lives of more than 200,000 people. At the massacre of Nanking, this, one of the great war crimes of the 20th century, took place more than 70 years ago. When the Japanese took this city, looting, raping and murdering, Raba was there to witness the atrocity. He was an ordinary middle manager at an engineering company. Today, only his diaries bear witness to what he achieved. His grandson looks after them. The testimony of a man who worshipped Hitler and did good deeds, who stubbornly pursued a simple idea and saved hundreds of thousands of lives. battle for Shanghai, the beginning of the Japanese invasion of China. The Japanese Empire has used a small firefight as a pretext to launch a massive incursion. The Japanese plan calls for the capture of Shanghai in three days, but Tokyo has miscalculated. The Chinese army puts up fierce resistance. Hundreds of thousands die. Shanghai doesn't fall until the 9th of November, three months later. The strategy of the quick victory has failed. 70,000 Japanese soldiers have been killed. As a result of that, there was a very heightened sense for revenge among the Japanese troops, down to the ordinary soldier who had lost uh, his comrade. And this, in some ways, was one of the causes for the behavior of the Japanese troops after the Battle of Shanghai. New orders are issued. March on Nanjing, then Nanking, China's capital, 270 kilometers to the west. But Japanese troops are exhausted and their supply lines are almost non-existent. They advance, leaving a bloody trail of pillage and murder. Within days, the first bombs are falling on Nanking in what soon becomes a daily assault. John Raba is on vacation far away from Nanking. He hurries back to the office and his work for Siemens, the German industrial giant. He knows the city only has weeks before the Japanese arrive. He can follow their progress via Radio Shanghai, still broadcasting after the takeover. Since the attack on Shanghai, John Raba has kept a diary. The early entries make depressing reading. All the wealthy Chinese have long ago begun to flee up the Yangtze. Many Americans and Germans have gone with them. Hundreds of Western diplomats and businessmen have sent their families ahead of them to safety. They're staying only long enough to wind up their affairs. John Raba is lucky. His wife, Dora, is staying on at their vacation resort. His children and grandchildren have already left China. Raba must make a decision. But there is one moral point I cannot get past. Our Chinese servants and employees all look up to their master. These poor serving classes simply do not know what to do. Can I? Have I the right to run away under these circumstances? I think not. Anyone who has ever held the hand of a Chinese child for hours on end, squatting in a dugout during an air raid, 
will know what I mean. Mein Großvater war hanseatischer Kaufmann. Er war pflichtbewusst und korrekt im Umgang mit seinem Arbeitgeber und seinen Kunden. In seinem privaten Umfeld war er dominant, aber sonst war er eigentlich ein schlichter und bescheidener Mensch. A few others will also stay in the city. Georg Rosen, a diplomat at the German Embassy, and two American missionaries, Minnie Vautrin and John McGee. They all know each other from Nanking's exclusive international club. But all they really have in common at this moment is their decision to remain in the doomed city. They've turned their backs on the river Yangtze, the only sure means of escape. Nanking has always been a fortress city, protected by 35 kilometers of city wall, 15 meters high. But in the 20th century, a wall like this won't hold up the invaders. It'll confine the inhabitants like rats in a trap. Behind the city is the Yangtze. There is no bridge. But Raba and his colleagues come up with a daring idea. With the remaining foreign community, they could try to create a protection zone inside the city for women, children, and the elderly. It could cover several square kilometers. They know from Shanghai that something like this is feasible. Only now is it possible to tell the story of how Raba and his colleagues put their plan to action. Historian Huang Huoying has trawled the Nanjing city archives to reconstruct the events. ...established that John Raba, the punctilious German manager, took the leading role in the plan. For now, he is isolated. He can barely contact his wife, Dora. He can only write, with some relief, to his children in Germany. Our family is now spread right across the world. His distant homeland is important to John Raba. He was born in Hamburg in 1882. His sea captain father was a strict disciplinarian and brought up his son as a perfect subject of the German Empire. But he also gave John a love for travel. His first name came from an uncle in Australia. John soon won the love of his life, Dora, the chemist's daughter, through a piece of simple heroism. Sie wohnte in der Nachbarschaft und mein Großvater lernte sie kennen. Da war die Dora vier Jahre alt und fiel in eine Pfütze. Und mein Großvater hat sie aus der Pfütze rausgeholt und das war der Beginn einer lebenslangen Liebesgeschichte. When John's father died at an early age, John went to work as a trainee in an import-export house, and that launched him out into the world. For several years, he traveled through Africa, mostly in Mozambique, a rootless adventurer, taking jobs and life as it came. At the age of 26, he traveled to China, and a year later, Dora joined him. They would stay in China for 30 years. The houses were dripping with damp, he would say, and the cracks in the floor were so big you could talk to the neighbors through them. But Raba knew how to make the best of things and slowly won promotion. Siemens built turbines, telephone exchanges, and hospital equipment. Raba became general manager of the Nanking branch. He went back to Germany only twice, but he pinned his hopes for the future on a distant authority figure, the Führer, Adolf Hitler. While sorting through his belongings, waiting for the Japanese, Raba found a poem written by one of Hitler's most loyal lieutenants, Baldur von Schirach. This is the greatest thing of all. He is not just our Führer and our nation's shield. He is himself, simple, strong, standing tall. 
while in him sleep the roots of all the world. His soul may reach to heaven, to the sky, but he is still a man like you and I. Rabba took it literally. He believed every word. That gave me courage again. A simple, straightforward person like you or me wouldn't just feel sympathy for the sufferings of his own people, but also for the people of China. Rabba believed and continued to believe that the Führer would stand by him. In 1934, he joined the Nazi party. Er wollte, dass die Eltern Geld vom Reich für die Schule bekommen, weil die sehr teuer war. Und da musste jemand in die Partei eintreten. Immerhin wusste er so viel, dass die, El dass die Eltern das nicht gerne taten. Also trat er ein als der Gründer dieser Schule und erhielt es für richtig und klug. The German school, part of the privileged postcolonial lifestyle of foreigners in Nanking. For Raba, joining the party was no sacrifice. For a while, he would even be regional party leader in Nanking. A student stayed with Raba for several weeks. Erwin Wickert would later publish extracts from Raba's diaries. He was kein Intellektueller. He was an einfacher man, aber immer humorvoll. He saw in jeder Situation, selbst in den späteren schrecklichen Situationen, noch einen komischen. Aspect. Rabe loved to sketch, especially ravens, the translation of Rabe's name from German. And he accompanied the drawings with little ditties that helped take the pressure off when times got bad. Even in the darkest days when the bombs were falling. A dugout's not the place to hide when bombs are falling far and wide. It only takes a tiny shard of steel to hit you nice and hard. The Chinese Defense Army in Nanking mobilizes all its forces. The capital is to be defended to the last man. Those are the orders. But sandbags piled against the south gates will not stop the Japanese. Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek is China's dictator. He chose Nanking as the new capital of his nationalist government. It has supreme symbolic importance. It has the same significance for the invading Japanese. They've been extending their influence on the Asian mainland since 1931, when they burst from their Korean colony to occupy the Chinese province of Manchuria. It took them just five months to take a country half the size of Western Europe. Tokyo needs natural resources, above all, oil. Back at home, things have been going badly. Earthquakes, stock market jitters, and finally, after the Wall Street crash, Tokyo's markets collapse. The rural population are suffering most, sinking further and further into poverty. One solution, the army's solution, is further conquest. Emperor Hirohito gives the army free reign. Power goes to the people who proclaim the Japanese the Asian master race. Asian master race. The army must solve Japan's problems. Hirohito himself appoints the commander for the attack on Shanghai. He brings General Iwani Matsui out of retirement. The emperor probably also gives Matsui instructions to take Nanking. It should take four weeks for the Japanese army to reach the gates of Nanking, but with the invaders, all is not well. The troops were not well supplied. They have to uh, enter civilian homes and they have to resort to looting in order to become fed. So that added to the frustration. 
Meanwhile, Chinese soldiers who escaped from Shanghai are fleeing before the invaders. Among them is Li Gaoshan, forced to join the army at just 13. Many Chinese soldiers get lost and fall into the hands of the Japanese. They're brutally executed. Civilians receive no mercy. In villages along the route, men, women and children are gathered together and mown down by machine guns. <laughs> Meanwhile, John Raba is busy transferring his company's money out of the city. First, he pays out the salaries and wages. They will all receive their pay before the office shuts down. He will balance the books with German precision. The servants are going around with despairing expressions because they think I'm abandoning them. When I explain to them that I'm definitely staying in Nanking, they become happy again. The last foreigners in the city now set up the International Committee. Their vague intentions are becoming a firm plan. They will attempt to establish a protection zone for civilians. John Raba is elected chairman. The others believe a Nazi will have the best relations with the authorities, both the Chinese and the invaders. My protests are in vain. For the greater good, I give in. I hope I can be worthy of this post. It could become an onerous task. Nationalist Chinese leader Chiang Kai-shek is still determined to defend Nanking. But his generals advise him against it. Resistance is pointless, strategically worse than useless. So Chiang Kai-shek leaves the city and the mayor goes with him. One army general remains. John Raba is now the only civilian authority left in Nanking. The departing Chinese have left him just $40,000. With the government gone, hundreds of thousands of refugees quit the city. By crossing the Yangtze, freezing cold in a wintry November, or taking the railroad to an uncertain future. The poor, the sick and the old stay behind with their families. They've heard a rumor of a possible protection zone. They're desperate for it to be true. Every day the civilians pray for clouds because in a clear day the bombers come without fail. Raba calls it bombing weather. Most of the victims are civilians. One point three million people live in Nanking. For most, it's now too late to leave. The cameraman taking these pictures will stay. He will continue filming long after the Japanese arrive. The American missionary. John McGee. It was dangerous, very dangerous. But he was determined he had these pictures. They were a documentation of what the Japanese were doing to show the world. The Japanese never knew my father was taking these movies. Otherwise, they would have shot him. Later, McGee will smuggle the rolls of film out of the city to be processed, sewn into the lining of his overcoat, proof of Japanese crimes. 
For now, though, Raba faces practical problems. He must feed the hundreds of thousands starting to flood into the protection zone. He must stock up on medicines against the risk of epidemics. He just gets going. He calls in all his contacts, has rice gathered from the surrounding countryside, commandeers or purchases all the available gasoline and medicines. And he lists everything, like the dutiful manager he is, so that everything can be fairly distributed. We have to get flour, salt, fuel, medicine and pots and pans into our zone before the Japanese arrive. We can't wait until the last minute because by then we shall be cut off from the world. Raba even opens the garden of his own house to refugees. Eventually there are 600 people camping there. Li Shizhen is one of them. Mu Si Fu, who would become her husband, also shelters in John Raba's garden. Raba keeps strict office opening hours for the refugees. He works patiently through all the notes and requests he receives. The bureaucrat as savior. He explains his actions to the Chinese in terms of his Nazi ideology. The Nazis are a government of the workers. They will not abandon poor people to their fate. Raba believes deeply in help from the very top, from the Führer. On the 25th of November, he writes a telegram to Hitler. Head of the Nanking Regional Party Office requests that the Führer employ his good offices with the Japanese government to engage their consent for the creation of a neutral zone for non-combatants. Unless this is done, more than 200,000 lives are in danger. Raba has seen only the attractive side of National Socialism, like the Olympic Games of 1936, ideal international propaganda for the regime. But even in Germany, most people don't acknowledge the regime's fundamental inhumanity. It's difficult to say whether 8,000 kilometers away, Raba would be aware of book burning and the persecution of the Jews. But he certainly knows that Germany and Japan have become allies. In 1936, they formed the Anti-Comintern Pact, directed against the Soviet Union. Italy soon joined them. Berlin, Tokyo and Rome went on to sign the Three Power Agreement, claiming vast spheres of influence. On the two days following Raba's telegram to Hitler, no bombs fall on Nanking. Raba is sure that the Führer has put pressure on the Japanese government. He's heard nothing from Berlin, but that doesn't worry him. An answer from Hitler cannot be expected. This kind of delicate diplomatic issue is no doubt dealt with on another level. Nothing will shape Raba's trust in the goodness of the German authorities. He believes what he reads in the German newspapers, like many expatriates. Sie sahen die negativen Seiten nicht oder hielten sie für Feindpropaganda. Es gab deutsche Zeitungen in China, die eben auch zusehends unter Kontrolle der Nationalsozialisten gerieten und wo es eben ein geschöntes Bild Deutschlands gab. 
but a fellow member of the International Club has every reason to know the truth about the Nazis. German diplomat Georg Rosen has a Jewish grandmother. The foreign ministry is forcing him out of his job. But even this doesn't open Rabe's eyes. Rabe wird gesehen haben, dass ein Vater auch in Deutschland überhaupt keine Zukunft mehr hatte, dass ihm jeder berufliche Aus Aufstieg schon verbaut war und äh, dass ihm äh, der Verlust der beruflichen Existenz überhaupt drohte. In his diary, Rabe wrote, his grandmother has ruined his career. It's a tragic fate. The Japanese have broken through the last line of defense before Nanking. The bombers are now hitting home day and night. Some Japanese commanders proposed bombing Nanjing to the last person. Uh, some even contemplated the use of uh, poison gas in the attack on Nanjing. So that shows there was a disregard for international law. No one has ever found a written order confirming this disregard. No one can say for sure that leading generals or the emperor himself knew about these excesses. But most historians believe that atrocities were tolerated. There was a policy to terrorize the Chinese population. There was some kind of order issued at a relatively high level of the Japanese field army to dispose of the Chinese uh, prisoners. By the beginning of December, the people of Nanking can hear the thunder of the Chinese guns. Hundreds of Chinese soldiers are still falling back on the city. Thousands more will not make it. The International Committee are now meeting every day. Only the diehards have remained. Embassy personnel are being evacuated. The Americans load up their belongings and make for the gunboat USS Panay, moored in the Yang to take them to safety upstream. John Raba, John McGee and a few others go on board the Panay to send a final appeal to the Japanese. No acts of war should take place inside the city. But no member of Raba's committee leaves on the Panay. John Raba and my father and people in here said, no, we can't leave. Our job is not to save our lives, it's to help save the Japanese, Chinese people from rape and murder and everything else, so they stayed. Shortly after half past one on the afternoon of 12th of December, Japanese dive bombers attacked the Panay. The crew are totally unprepared. They were convinced they were safe. The bombs wrecked the bridge and the engine room, leaving the ship without power. By the time the captain calls abandoned ship, She's already sinking. This is original footage of the attack. Japanese planes strafe the lifeboats. Even when the survivors reach the shore, the Japanese continue bombing. We were in England, there wasn't much communication those days. And we heard that Americans had been ordered to go on this gunboats, they called them. And we heard it was sunk and many American lives were lost. I said, oh my God. Three men die. 48 are wounded. Two and a half hours after the attack, the Panay sinks. Today, an attack like this might start a war. But America, still horrified by the slaughter of World War I, is firmly isolationist. Washington simply takes note of this provocation. President Roosevelt protests to Tokyo, 
and accepts compensation of $2.2 million. If the Purple Mountain beyond the city walls burns, Nanking is lost, Raba writes in his diary. The day after the sinking of the Pane, this old Chinese proverb comes true. Early that day, 250,000 Japanese soldiers reach Nanking. Japanese artillery destroys the city walls. The conquerors have everything to celebrate. Tokyo has sent its newsreel cameramen. They must immortalize this scene for home consumption. General Matsui takes center stage. He has been promoted to Commander-in-Chief China. For now, the Japanese seem relatively restrained. The staged newsreels are deceptive. Behind the scenes, the massacre of Nanking has already begun. Raba records similar scenes in his diary. As we drove around the city, we realized the scale of the destruction. Every 100 or 200 meters, we came across corpses. They showed signs of having been shot in the back. There is barely any Chinese resistance. Just before the arrival of the Japanese, the general defending the city changed his tactics and gave the order to withdraw. Too late. The result is chaos. Few of the Chinese soldiers can escape the Japanese invaders. Anyone who is caught has no chance. John McGee films in secret as Japanese troops gather together Chinese soldiers who've tried to disguise themselves as civilians. The conquerors show no mercy. Tens of thousands of soldiers try to flee to the north along the Yangtze. The Japanese force them together at Yangtzeji Mountain. There they bayonet and behead them, burn them alive and shoot them. Between 50 and 60,000 Chinese prisoners of war. This is one of many sites. This one is a memorial. The Japanese also murder fleeing civilians. <laughs> Chang Chiu Tsiang is nine years old. In the confusion, he blacks out. Moments later, he comes round again. Chile, Chile, 
。哦，最后我才明白，我妈妈是一份小姐弟弟为奶。His five brothers and sisters, his parents and his grandparents are all killed. Siashu Tsin's family are also trapped by the Japanese. But they all went out. Those people who had money went out. You see, we, 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 Like Sia Shuqin's family, but they're found. Two children, one of them was hit by a stone. He was hit by a stone. Because my mother, because she was young, she was very young. She was only nine years old. 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 就桌子外边啊，就吐出来，等两个桌子拼起来，然后上面板门，还立着担子，打起来。他走到桌子上面，吐出来以后，把我小妹妹、一岁的妹妹就就活活的就砸死了，砸在院子里头。所以砸在院子以后，就活活砸死了，拿枪头子打的。Sia Shuqin and one sister are the only survivors of the family. John McGee films the bodies and the woman who finally brings the two children to the safety of the protection zone. John Raba documents the horror in his diary. He notes every crime he becomes aware of, a total of 444. Making a list in a massacre gives him something to hold on to. There are now 200,000 people in the protection zone, including many thousands of Chinese soldiers in civilian clothes. Raba protects them all in an unusual way, with swastika flags. He hopes that the Japanese, Germany's allies, will not attack the Nazi symbol. 就说当时安全区呢，他们用小旗子、三角旗把它围起来的。那么这个安全区里面呢，有二十五个这个难民收容所，就是很多这个他们而去当时发出通告，就是说呼吁全市的市民，就是你们进来吧，我们就是成立了这样一个安全区。他们当时都不敢叫安全区，叫难民区。No one can be sure if these people will survive. Again and again, Japanese soldiers break into the safety zone. Because of the numerous intrusions by the individual Japanese soldiers into the safety zone in Nanjing to get women or to loot, um, the International Safety Zone Committee made repeated requests to the Japanese authorities to put uh, military police at various uh, entry points to keep away the Japanese soldiers. Raba stations his own guards, but they can't stop many of the crimes. His study has become the committee's headquarters. One simply cannot grasp the degree of suffering here, he writes on the fourth day of the massacre. He still believes the men in authority will act when they learn the scale of the crimes. Every day he sends telegrams to the high command of the Japanese army, asking them to keep their soldiers in check. Ginglin College, a women's university campus. It's the main goal for the Japanese incursions in the zone. Today it's part of the University of Nanjing. During the massacre, 10,000 women and girls sheltered here. Mini Votra, missionary and college principal, tries to protect them as best she can. John Raba never neglects his tour of duty. He regularly visits the wounded at Gulo Hospital. There's just one surgeon here to treat all the patients. He operates round the clock, an American, Robert Wilson. Dr. Wilson showed me some of his patients. The woman who has several bayonet wounds to the face, who was brought in with a miscarriage, is doing reasonably well. A sampan owner who was shot in the jaw and whose whole body has been burnt because they poured gasoline over him and lit it will probably die. 
，强人，强健富的，我们大大辈呀，没得，没强过人，没有得得过人，哪辈做么呀？不知道哪辈我们死了，不再活了。More and more people crowd into the protection zone. Raba's garden is seen as the safest place of all. Raba is everywhere, in his garden, in the whole zone, looking after the most desperate people. They need him, his encouragement, and his care. Often he distributes food himself. With his weapons, swastika armband, steel helmet, and typewriter, he's fighting the tide of history. And this loyal party member still believes he's doing his Führer's work. In his diary, he notes with pride. Whenever detachments of Japanese soldiers come into my house, they disappear again as soon as I hold my swastika armband under their noses. Don't watch it, but the the funny guy. 日本人不敢惹，不敢去。日本人进来啊，还叫出去，爬墙头进来，爬墙头出去，不那个，不给他锁门走。Week after week, John Raba fights for the people of Nanking. They call him master. He is their servant. Their survival is his duty. In dieser Situation ist er über sich hinausgewachsen. Alle Leute. In dieser Situation ist er über sich hinausgewachsen. Alle Leute, die ihn damals in Aktion gesehen hatten, waren begeistert von der Art und tief berührt, wie er sein eigenes Leben oft aufs Spiel setzte. It would be an unfamiliar sight. The swastika as a symbol of humanitarian aid. John Raba, the good Nazi of Nanking. John Raba has saved more than 200,000 people from almost certain death. After several weeks, the Japanese move on. The survivors try to pick up their lives. In thanks, they present John Raba with a silken scarf. May the grace of heaven be upon you, it says. For the rest of his life, John Raba will be venerated as a living Buddha. After the massacre, John Raba returns to Germany. Siemens has ordered him home. In his luggage is his diary and a copy of McGee's film footage. Dora meets him in Shanghai. They will travel home together from there. Ein englisches Kanonenboot hat ihn dann in Nanking abgeholt. Er wurde von der internationalen Presse und der internationalen Gesellschaft gefeiert wie ein Held. Nur in Deutschland wusste man nichts von ihm. As soon as he arrives in Berlin, Raba starts giving talks and presentations. He wants to make sure influential people in the Nazi regime are aware of the massacre of Nanking. At Siemens headquarters, he addresses a gathering of senior Nazis as a true German patriot. I would like to say at the outset that it is not my intention to spread anti-Japanese propaganda. Even though I feel the deepest sympathy for the sufferings of China, I am, in the first place, pro-German. But that does not alter my belief that it is right that our beloved Führer and leading figures of our fatherland should know the truth about the events in Nanking. A few days later, two men pay a visit to his apartment. Raba follows them without a word. His diaries under his arm. His granddaughter is playing outside. Ich merkte irgendwie, es muss etwas Peinliches sein, denn natürlicherweise wäre ich meinem Großvater entgegengerannt und wir hätten uns gegenseitig umarmt und. Schönen Weg und mach's gut und komm wieder. Und so habe ich ihm also nur guten Tag gesagt und so zugewunken. The Gestapo interrogate Raba for three days. 
He never talks about it, except to say that they shone a light straight into his face. John Rabba never again speaks publicly about his experiences in Nanking. He is allowed to keep his diaries. Rabba's faith in Adolf Hitler remains undiminished. Rabba even writes him one last letter. My Führer, in sending the attached account, I have fulfilled a promise to my friends in China to let you know about the sufferings of the people of Nanking. My mission will be fulfilled if you have the goodness to let me know that this account has been laid before you. The last words of John Rabba's war diary. John Rabba lives on with Dora in straitened circumstances. He does occasional small jobs for Siemens. A living Buddha in China and an outcast in Germany, he says, with grim humor. Huang Huaying has found documents that show how hard the survivors of the massacre tried to help Rabba. There was a long correspondence. Finally, the people of Nanking raised $2,000 for food packets to send to Germany. The people of Nanking stood by the man who protected them. In the USA, John McGee also tried to alert influential people to the crimes in Nanking without success. Georg Rosen returned home briefly to Germany before fleeing to London in late 1938. Minnie Votra committed suicide in the USA in 1941. She couldn't forgive herself for not saving more women. Those responsible for the massacres were prosecuted at the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal in 1948. The court concluded that General Matsui did nothing to prevent the massacres of Chinese prisoners of war and of the civil population in Nanking. He was condemned to death. Shortly afterwards, Japan acknowledged the Tokyo verdicts. But there is still no consensus in Japan about the massacre. Some still try to make light of the atrocities. いろんな問題ありますね、現実の。a monument in Nanjing commemorates the massacre. In six weeks, 300,000 died. Well, most Japanese are prepared to accept the historical responsibility for the massacre. Tokyo has apologized to China several times. But it's not an especially convincing gesture. Many people in Japan have garnered evidence and make the argument to show that it was not as bad as the Chinese official history uh, claim it to be. Um, so 
there are different ways of looking at it, but I would say in terms of historians, serious historians in Japan, they recognize it was a major atrocity. Today, John Raba's house in Nanjing is a memorial. He has never been recognized in the West. At first, he was even refused denazification after the war. He died in Berlin in 1950, sick, poor, and forgotten. If you are passionate about documentaries, log on to view more programs, read articles, and join the discussion online at sbs.com.au slash documentary.